Olivia Mabeuf, uh, Flight Towards a Common Ground. Um, I'm not going to spend too long introducing Olivia because I think this talk will be introducing his practice historically, only to say that Olivia is a writer, a performer, a curator, and also a film producer, so many talents. Um, and he's interested both in the social composition of diasporic communities, um, but also in um, processes of knowledge transmission um, and also speculative, speculative narratives. So Olivia ran a space, Espas Chiasma, which he's going to talk about, I think, uh, for about 14 years from 2004 uh, in the Banlieue of Paris. And he's now involved in um, a radio, radio production series and also produced films um, with a project called Spectre Productions. Um, so I think um, his website, uh, his blog, is on the um, is on the VLE. If you want to visit that, and as I said, some of his talks are available also on the VLE. So I think that's going to be my introduction. Olivia, are you are you available? I saw you earlier on. Yeah, I'm here. Great, thank you. Um, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sohail. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's a bit impressive to talk to, to so many people, but in front of a computer, and how we'll have an occasion in the future to meet for real, as we should say. Uh, I will begin with a few elements for, to help us to talk, to have that conversation. The third thing is that the presentation that well, that to have presents. Uh, my name is uh, misread. Is misread. Sorry. Oh, it's I'm made, sorry. Is misread. No, but I think it's, it's super interesting because I think it could be a first introduction. Of course, I think I always consider that we have to situate from where you are speaking, and so I will give you different uh, point about the situationness of my of my speech. And the first one could be my name, because my name is Olivier Marbeuf, which is hard to, to, to spell, to write for a lot of people, because it's typically French. So it's, at the end, it's O-E-U-F. That's not the opposite. But it's nice, because I think this name is not really the name. It is the name of the owner of uh, the family of my father in the French Caribbean context. My grand, the father of my grandfather was born as a slave. So the name we've got is the name as we receive as a product of the plantation. So I think you can write the name as you want, but if you want to find some information about me online, it's, it's perhaps better to use the, the right orthography. But otherwise, this name, I'm not so attached to that name. And in a way, I'm attached to it as a matter that can be, um, let's say, a matter that I can work with, not as something that naming something. And so the issue of naming has been uh, for a long time a part of my job. But what I would like to say is the first thing I will give you some elements about the context where I'm speaking from, but don't hesitate during the out talk and. Um, in the chat to ask some questions because I think I'm, I'm going to talk about a specific context which is quite close to the UK one but very different, really different. And I think the first thing I would like to say is that we have to be careful not globalize all the hiding on all the contexts, even in the Western context. I'm from France and more specifically, I'm coming from the outskirts of Paris. And being from the outskirts of Paris is something really specific. I will say that in France, people will say we are often outskirts. The name is banlieue in French. That means the place for the banished people, banlieue. So it's really meaningful when people say I'm coming from Marseille, from Lyon, from Paris. It's not the same thing when people say I'm coming from the outskirts of Marseille, the outskirts of Lyon, the outskirts of Paris, because there is a real invisible story and kind of parallel stories of the outskirts in France that have been revisible each time there is a huge riot. And the riots in the outskirts in France is always, has always the same kind of beginning, which is the murder of a black young man. 
So we are in the part of that storage, which is really connected also with the global Black Lives Matter movement. But, and so I'm, I'm coming from that people from the outskirts. Just to give you an image globally, in, in Paris, in the inner city of Paris, there is 2,000 and a half million of people, and the outskirts of Paris is 10 million people. So when you got an image of Paris, just imagine there was five times more people around than inside, and that inside or not inside is really significant, socially, politically, racially in France. So I think I'm, um, yeah, I try to, uh, I try to, to introduce that first thing that is really that idea of the outskirts in France. And so my family is coming uh, partly from uh, an island, a small island in the Atlantic and the, in the Caribbean context called Guadeloupe. And as you may know that France is still an empire with some islands here and there in the Pacific Ocean, in the Indian Ocean and in the Atlantic Ocean. And those uh, colonies, colonial territory are called departments or territory and they are supposed to be French. That means that they, they, they bring with them some Schengen front lines in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, and in the Atlantic. There is not only a right to citizen, there is also borders, and we what we call our borders. And I think we reproduce the, the situation of the Mediterranean context in all the oceans. That's why we, we, can, we are uh, some people, some of us consider that I was still an empire. So, um, so that's that the introduction. I'm coming from what I call uh, two different peripheries of that empire. The first one is the outskirts, and the second one is the Caribbean island called Guadeloupe, where my father was born. And so I think it's really important also to, to, to get the idea that in that context of that peripheral of France, we got a specific uh, perspective of looking at the heart of the empire, the core of the empire, the center of the empire. And all I'm gonna try to talk about today is a really new and specific uh, relationship in between the periphery and the center from with people of my generation and the new generation to come and how to attempt to get out from the desire of the center, from an imagination of the center. So being a periphery, not cause there is a center, but being a, in the periphery as being in the world. So it's really important. And I think all what we are calling in France, the decolonial practices, is not the desire to have the power of the center, is not being people of, the, of color in the center of attention and where what I call the scene of representation of the Republic, but to have the right to stay in a certain periphery, protect by a certain shadows and be able to tell the story from that periphery without any desire and any imagination from the center. So to come to what uh, Suhail says about uh, the whiteness, I uh, always use in my text, and we will come back to it later, the, um, the idea of the white body of reference. Because I think the most interesting things for me coming from visual art, like most of you, is not to consider only the whiteness as a kind of phenotypic uh, dimension as a color, let's say, but more as a position. And that position is a centrality and the desire to be in the center of attentions. That's why I says that being in the periphery is also a kind of movement towards another place, which is for me a place for the commons in the future. And it's out from the influence of that central body. So refusing to be uh, produced by a relation with that central figure. I'm not a human cause. I have to I have to compare myself to another kind of humanity. We're all human. 
and there is no body of reference of the humanity, which is, I think, a central issue uh, in the in epistemic violence in, with the whiteness that is produced in different way, because I think we can be really focused on the super clear violence produced by the white patriarchy in the world. But I myself spend more time in the, what I call the innocence and the white innocence and the white ignorance. That means those people who don't consider that they are violent and they don't have them that, that don't, they don't say they are violent, they don't act that way, but they are, as Isabel Stengers, the Belgian philosopher would say, they are acts by a system. So it's not as you acting as a person, but our system is acting through your body. And so I think it could be something we can consider, for instance, with the, the way we educate people. And I do think that the whiteness is a way also to educate people have to have a desire for ascension. And personally, all my work is, a, is an attempt to dismantle, yeah, deconstruct, deconstructing um, uh, that desire of being the center, considering that is only one position and is super important, of course, in the context of the heart world, that desire of centrality is really the, the most toxic dimension of the heart world. So how to build uh, a way of being, a way of living, a way of breathing together in the heart world without that issue, that desire of centrality. Is, is it possible to imagine being actively involved in the heart world as I am without that kind of desire and building also all together other places of shadow and in the periphery? So this is the first introduction, and I will come to some really short uh, examples of what I did, because we can't go through, but I will try to be really quick to go from one point to today, and trying to stress the, in the more sensely way uh, how I, I did that journey. I would say that there is two way, and I'm, um, 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 I'm a storyteller, and I says there is two ways of telling a story. You can tell a story from uh, the, the perspective of the time when you were living an event, and you can tell a story from now. And it's two different ways of telling the stories, and I think it's all really often really interesting to try to do both. And I will try sometimes to say, I was thinking about that at that time, and what I think now is that. Because I think it's really important when you ask to uh, people to try to challenge, for instance, for instance, the whiteness, to consider that you are in a position now and you can be in a different position in the future. There is a kind of uh, pledge, which is for me really central and I have to be really generous. Otherwise, it's just an issue of power. And I don't personally want to have a new king which would be a queer black woman. I don't want a queen or a king. I don't want it. So I think it's more dismantling, dismantling the statues instead of replacing the statue by another statue. And so it's super important because it's really an issue of imagination and desire. Are we able to fight against our own desire of power, but in the same way have enough energy to dismantle other desire of power? That's why that Sometimes we are at some point and we want to go to another point and we have to be patient and courageous to do so. So the first thing is, is I'm not coming from the heart. I, I never study heart like you are doing. And I think it's going to be really nice to do so. But I study science. And it, it had a relationship with my social background. I'm coming from a working class background. My parents were really uh, really simple walkers and my father for my father as a non-white person the only one way to be to become somebody in the French society it was to be a, such a kind of engineer and my first my first name is Olivier because the boss of my father was called Olivier so you see that there is in that attempt of to be as we said in France integrated in the system there is a kind of projections 
in the white body from the perspective of my father. But Olivier, my first name, but in between Olivier and Marbert, there is my real name called, which is Mohana. And Mohana is the name that my family used, my friend used, and Mohana means ocean. So there is an ocean in between the two continents. The Olivier, which is a tree in France, the Marbeuf is the plantation in the Caribbeans, and in between there is the hidden name, which is the ocean. So, and my good friend and my family called me Mo, that means that's his reduction, uh, reduction of Mohana. So this is that. So naming things is always super important. And so as to the science, because my father, he, he was, convinced that the best solutions to, to have a place in the society was to, to this sense, not to do art. And so it's having an accident as to the science and I met another student when I was in the University of Science of uh, the, the south of Paris, which was the most famous one. And I met another student who was, was a mixed race person like me, was a French and also from Benin, and my family is coming from Benin. And so we call Yvon Alak B. And with Yvon, we create our first a project on night in, the, in our room as a students. Uh, it was a publisher. And the first gesture I did with Yvon at that time have been super significant for the rest of my life until now. That story took place in the 90s. It was on, on the 1991. So the, uh, yeah, the 20th centuries that it's a pre-internet life you know at that time and so even was a, in still a comics uh, artist and he was studying mathematics and me too and he, he was drawing drawing a lot and so we have we, we become friends i was totally not interested at that time in art or culture but i was really a, a sport fan and i'm still um but funny I, because my mother told me that to be a football player was not a job, so I decided not to do so. But now she knows it's a job, and so, but it's too late. And so, so I do accept to, to do that science university for my parents, I have to say. And when we met Yvon, we were in the same situation with also, uh, with our, in, on our shoulders, all the desire on the projection of our own family to become, uh, yeah, to teach. To, to try to move from a little bit working class to somewhere else. And so Yvon was drawing at night and says, yeah, it's nice to have a comics draw and school. And so, uh, and he told me, yeah, I'm, I'm doing some drawings and preparing books to send it to a publisher. What is really specific and connect to the whiteness idea in the French context. And at that time, and still mainly now, all the publishers in France are concentrated in one or two or three street maximum in the center of Paris. They are all there, they're all white and they're all at the same place. So trying to publish something at that time, it was preparing some text, some drawings, I don't know, and sending your, your, your work to those people. And so on one evening talking with them and says, I, I ask him something that that will, after that, change all my life and says, don't you think it's, it would be simpler to do a publisher ourselves? And says, yeah, Olivia, doing a publisher. Are you mad? I think we are, I'm drawing and I want to be published. Yes, but I'm sure you are waiting for answer for those people. They, they, they don't consider us because we are people from the outskirts. We are really shit. And at that time, it was super strong because what happened at that, on the 80s, on the nineties in, in the house of Paris, it was more rap music. It was our activities was that, but it was not writing books, doing comics and other things like that. Uh, and, and we never talked about at that time of contemporary art, of course. And so he says, okay, but you want to do a publisher, but let's do that, but how are you gonna do that? I don't know, I'm gonna begin, I'm gonna begin that tomorrow. And in one year, we will have our own publisher. So I did that, and publisher called Hammock, and he's still existing under the name of Fremok, because it's, it's the association in between a Belgian publisher and a French publisher. And since that time, everything I did, uh, uh, I've tried to be um, uh, a kind of intersection in between uh, a content, doing an art, uh, talking about that, and a structural issue. 
how to do that? What are the conditions to do that? Is it possible to do that? And try to improve those conditions. Why it's not possible to do so? And so I do think when I'm talking about postcolonial, but more now about decolonial theory, it's really that movement that's trying to get out of the thematical of, uh, let's say, anti-racist, for instance, to try to see the structural level who says, yeah, it's not only how an artwork is talking about racial issue, gender issue, I don't know, sexual issue, but how the structural organization of the production of it is, uh, is intersectional, for instance. So moving from the idea of thematic to the idea of the structural practice is not for me, uh, in my experience, getting out from uh, uh, my involvement in art, but just trying to consider that when you are coming from a minority perspective, you only always uh, see more with more uh, precision the structural effect, and you always feel that. And somebody like uh, the African American tuition, Fred Mutton, will say that we learn to be much more attentive than other people to some issues. We learn to feel more, to anticipate the violence. So for me, the idea of a specific body that is built by the, the kind of um, um, practice of anticipation is really a central issue in what I'm doing. So I do feel that if we have to talk about um, the difference in between whiteness and the non-whiteness, is the necessity for the non-whiteness to anticipate the violence, where the whiteness just have the desire of the center, which is the place when you don't have to anticipate anything because you are in the center of everything. And so it's not the desire for me, the issue, but more the protection against violence, which is something for me a really, a really strong issue. But also you have to build some place. And I always say, and I discover with Amok, that first publisher we did during 10 years with Yvonne, that from a minority perspective, you can't only produce um, a certain kind of speech. You can only speak. You have also to create a place to speak. So I think the place of enunciation is really central in the minority space. That means that you have to build two things at the same time. You have to build, uh, uh, to develop an imagination, but also to develop a, a kind of echo chamber to talk as Louis Sude Shokai uh, will say. That means that you have to create a kind of climate, a kind of textures, a kind of uh, echo of what you're going to say to be heard. That means that you have more than only uh, a good idea, a good artwork to do. You have to create a kind of structural way of echoing what you say and to amplify it in a way. So, and is what I think from now, uh, at, the, at the time when I was 20, 25, 20, uh, 25 years old, I was just thinking that it was a shortcut. Because as we says in a lot of really famous rap uh, song by the famous band called NTM, uh, if they close the door, so you break the window. And so we, we have been educated in our life as people from the outskirts to break the windows of all institutions. And so the real question that we all discuss, I think with so high, what do you do when the door is open? Because you learn to build your life by breaking windows and by being a kind of intruder in some situation. And what happens when the, the door is open? That means when you are invited in the scene of representation, but the scene that you didn't create. That's why I said, I think from the minority perspective, there is always the double movement of creating a situation and performing something in that situation. So creating a space. I'm just gonna try to use well um, Zoom to show you things. So um, hmm. I'm gonna do that, that. And so I think if I do it that way, yeah, it's not bad and that way. Yeah, we can see it, Olivia. 
You can see it, it's cool. Okay. Yeah, in, in, I'll just show you what I did after the, that. Uh, when I arrived in the north outskirts of Paris in a city called Lelila, a small city um, in the outskirts, I decided to create a play. Not decide, because the place formed me, I have to say. Because I was about uh, 30 years old and I decided to retreat. It was already the end of my career. I, said, I spent 10 years doing uh, uh, fanzine and after uh, publishing a lot of things. And so uh, it was enough. I said, okay, now I need some rest or pause. And so I decided, I found a flat in that street in Leila. And so just uh, when I arrived there, I was really, uh, yeah, I prepared myself to a new life, a cool life, I don't know, find a job, from the family, I don't know. And finally, uh, just uh, down to the windows of my flat, I saw a printer just about to close. They were just closing. And so I asked a question to people, do you know what, what that place is? Ah, it's a former printer. It's a printer of the neighborhood. But now it's closed, and so it's going to become a kind of loft or something like that. It says, OK, pity. So I get to the owner and says, OK, I got a project for that place. I didn't have any idea at that moment, precisely. But it's a really uh, a way of doing of people from the Oscars saying that they, they know how to do things they don't know. And so I was cool with that. I just told him, I'm gonna make something. And so he said, okay, if you clear the place, fix it, I'll let you stay here six months without paying any bill, any rent. And I accept that and stayed out for at the end uh, 15, 15 years. And so I'm, I'm, I'm showing first um, an image of the outside of the place because it's really significant. Several times in a year, we block the streets and so we install uh, a place where people can uh, hit, talk, listen to music. And so Jasma become a quite famous uh, place for contemporary art, but also a place where that, can, that kind of thing can happen. That means that people can get outside from their place and talk outside and eat and listen to music. And so I'll show you uh, other images. So this is the, the closing event of the seasons. And so we invite the neighborhood people to organize the closing event of the contemporary art center dedicated to visual art. But there is no real program from the art center itself. It's a, it's a way to invite the neighbor to, to create something to celebrate the close the, each year the closing of the place. So the concept was that uh, we don't program anything and just ask the people who want to do something that day to use the means we get to make the art center. So this woman is one a woman of the team. She's a, she's a technician uh, responsible and so she's also a rap singer. So that day she decided to, to Propose the rap. And inside the art center, I will show you all the images. Uh, all the, the plays were dedicated of everything we are doing outside of the art center during the year with schools, with neighbors, with uh, charities, and so on. Considering that um, the place is also, I always say, an, an art center, I have to care about what it wants to do, but also what is outside it want to do. That means that for me, the real idea of a community is not people that resembling that people that try to find a mirror in the body of the others, but the capacity of imagining and creating some connection with what is not you and what coming towards you. And what I call what is not coming towards, with, with a, towards you with a already known face what I call the concept of dirty faces, meaning that I can enter a new place with a dirty faces you can recognize, but you have to welcome me even if you can't see your face in mine. So this is for instance, the neighbor makes some recipe to cook things. And so they use the hat center during a month in June to present what they are doing using our tools and our means. So this is a small image of the outside. And you see the art center is really inside a neighborhood, inside a building. It's not a place outside of the common life. It's really, it's a for, uh, just beside, it's a former hotel. So yeah, it's really local things. That's it. 
And so I can come back really quickly to show that people are invited also to share food that day. So everybody's coming with something and prepare that. So it can be a kind of, let's say, a local, um, local activities, but it's also an art center. So inside there is some uh, friends of friends of friends. It's not the artist we program, but friends of the team that propose to make, some, to make people discover something that day. That thing, for instance. So just to say, the idea of chiasma is important for me because it's, uh, oh shit, uh, I, get up. I will come back to it really quickly. Just to tell you that the idea of chiasma, and it, it's in the name, the name is not an art center, but the global name of chiasma is espace chiasma. That means that it's not a center, but a space. That means that the emptiness of the, uh, of the concept is central. And I always feel that the idea of the community need that kind of uh, emptiness in the middle. So try to, to dig the, that um, right center, that center that could be a reference of what art is and what art is not. And so to dig in it, to create a space, a space to breathe, a space to imagine. So, I really tried to do that. I'm gonna show the other images of the um, of that. If I succeed in coming back to it, yeah, okay. And so, in the same space, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, in the same space, we also produce and display a lot of uh, contemporary artists. Like here is an installation by Philippa Cesar. And the same space you saw with the, with the recipe of the neighborhood can become like that for a show. So the idea that each show was not only displaying something, but also creating a space with color, with atmosphere, with a way of living. Because we consider that it was not only displaying a show, but also living with the show for a month each time. So each show was an occasion to transform the place and in certain way to invent a place. I'm gonna show just other displays just to give you an idea of that. Um, uh, Olivier, we couldn't see that. Yes. We could you see the images that you... Uh, we couldn't see the images when you... Ah, okay. Uh, so, so perhaps I didn't do it right. So that way you can see it? At the moment, no. Ah, votre, um, <laughs> uh, and if I do it, yeah. I don't know if I do. Um, Stop your screen um, share. Open up the images and then go back to screen share. Yeah, so I open all, yeah, I open all the images. I'm sorry. Really sorry for that. And That's so it. Now, now we you see it? Yeah. yeah. Ah, cool. Yeah, just, so, so this is uh, another display of the place. So Philippa says I show, as I said. And so just to show you that space is not only displaying a show, but creating a space in dialogue with artists. So each time the proposal was not only displaying uh, films or images or installation, but also creating a space. And what was nice is that the neighborhood, but also the art scene was always coming in a new space in Kiasma, because the wall space was a tool that we can, you know, transform to create a kind of stories. So how a space can be a, a tool to storytell something and not only a white tool to show things, you know. So this is the idea also of, yeah, of creating a specific, um, I'm gonna try to close, yeah. Uh, I, I'm gonna try to show you all the things just really quickly uh, to just to give you such a kind of uh, feelings of how it could have been the space. You show all the outside. Okay. I'm gonna share the screen again. Do you see it now? Yes. Yeah, cool. So 
this is the, the show of uh, the artist called Louis Anderson. It's, it's a UK artist, it's him. And so in that case, it was a show about the Atlantic century repaint of the wall uh, space. And also the space was also a space for encounters. So, you know, the space of, uh, of the show was also the space of encounter. It was a unique space, you know, where people can sit down, people can eat in and things can happen. So I would say the sacralization, the sacralization of the show have been displaced with the cast majesty because the, the show have been considered as a, a place to live and to experiment, you know. So it's also the idea of a community that inhabiting a space together and sharing a space with artists, but not only looking at images in a show. And I'll try just to see, I'll show you last things and it will be enough for, for Kiasma at the moment. Um, yeah. yeah, just to show you, yeah. Um, yeah, I can show you that. It's one of the last show I, I made in Kiasma. Um, do you see it? Hello? No, we can see, we can see your uh, file uh, selection thing, but not the actual images. Ah, yeah, so I have to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to again, I'm, I'm really sorry. I practiced, but I think that, no, did it work now? Yeah, that works. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, I'm just finishing with that. So this is also a display of an encounter in a show. And this is the outside. This is me speaking. And just to that, um, that show was one of the last one in Kiasma called uh, Sorry to Disturb You about, yeah, the practice of disturbing people instead of creating, you know, because I think people use a lot of the idea of creating as a way of caring, you know, and people overuse the notion of caring in front of your art. And I like to use the idea of disturbing, which is more honest, I would say, because uh, people uh, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't be there sometimes, and so they are there. So it's also a way to disturb. And only magic can see Fenwick Sauer, the uh, African um, Senegalese economist and tradition. Uh, it's a film that is what um, an ongoing process. Just to say something, just using that image that Kiasma have been really also particular, that that place was inscribed in a really neighborhood and in dialogue with the neighborhood, but it's also, also in dialogue with the heart field, because the place was also a place that only mostly display works that it produced. So really quickly, uh, um, Kiasma became a kind of structure of production for film and artist film. We produce a lot. And I create at the end of that um, um, a film producer as a tool. It's the same thing as a publisher, as a tool to be able to produce film for the art center. And when the art center closed, uh, I decide to keep on producing films, but for me, a production company is not a purpose by itself, it's only a tool, as an art center is a tool and, and publisher is a tool. So it's really important, otherwise, uh, um, finding an art center like a film producer become a kind of, of, of football team, you know. Um, I got the best team and my team is better. And so we become a kind of support of our own team in kind of stupid competition. And I do think that competition is a concert of the art field. So we have to find other ways to be together. And so, yeah, I go through really quickly on some things, but perhaps it's good nice to, hide, to open dialogue. And I got just a short example of film that I, I will share with you perhaps a bit later. That's it. Okay, you could share the film now if you want, I think. Yeah, I can, so I introduce it really quickly. So I'm a film producer. 
I try to keep on reflecting about uh, what the film is and what the thing could be. And as I show you, I considered that doing an art center it was do creating a space and a place. That means that it was not creating a kind of uh, value, a kind of, uh, but more creating a kind of tool that different people can use. And I try in my practice of film production. So now I'm produce about, yeah, I think about 50 films, um, short, long, etc. I try to imagine what could be uh, the cinema from a marriage perspective. And I'm working a lot in a, in a, in a writing about that idea of a cinema from the minority perspective, considering that people from the minority have to produce all during all their life a cinema. And in France, we, we got an expression that is faire, faire son cinema, as if you are making your cinema. That means that you are you are performing something. And so the idea of of cinema as a category of performance that is a kind of necessity from the minority perspective is for me super central. And so since a few years, uh, five, four and five years, I'm working in, in the context of the Caribbean context and mainly uh, those last year in Haiti, which is the first black republic and is a super interesting place for people who want to reflect about whiteness. Because when you know the French Revolution, we often don't know the Haitian Revolution that have been much more uh, ambitious than the French one and his two. And, and this is the real universal, universal uh, revolution and the first one that exists that way. Because in France, when French, in the French context, the declaration of, uh, of the equality of the old human that have been written in the context of the French Revolution, it was without really considering the difference of rising between men and female, for instance, but also uh, considering that it was possible that some people in that moment, that were black people, could be slaves at the same time. So remember that means of the French Revolution are coming from the slavery economy, which is a kind of contradiction that, that is spawned by the Haitian Revolution that decide to consider that all the existence and not only human existence this says at that time all the existence were and all the existence cycles which is much more ambitious and which is coming from black a black perspective that changed totally the sense of the western modernity if you consider that the Haitian revolution is the first really universal one and so I think I don't say that to defend the side on the side, just to say that those perspectives are really useful, even when you're coming from the Western perspective, to learn uh, the kind of entanglement in between uh, some events. And there is a real kind of twin revolutions in between Haitian and French one. And so it's not normal that we don't know anything about the Haitian. I know a lot, but I think most of the French people, and I think elsewhere, people don't know a lot about that revolution, which is conceptually super useful. And so I've been in IT working uh, with uh, the filmmaker, uh, Louis Anderson, and we work together since years with a collective called The Living and the Dead Ensemble. And the question of the film of the space is also a question of the uh, structural questions. I don't consider that I can go to the global south saying, okay, I'm gonna make something about you. Come, come in my film and speak that we have to instill, and we did, to instill a, a, a practical negotiation of what to do in a way to, to empty the film um, from the subject. So the film is, the film, Uvertu, I'm gonna show you an ex excerpt of that, doesn't have any subject in the sense nobody stand in or in or on the sense of representation to be represented as the others, I don't know what, but just everybody is making the film as a matter that we can actively work on. That means that the conditions are always negotiated in real time, and the film is not there to represent a certain gaze. Instead, is, there is a kind of multi, multiplicity of, uh, I will call a plural vocality in the sense of the sound and a multi-perspective 
in the sense of the gas. So this is the experimental dark film called Ouverture that I've been screened at the premiere in uh, last February in the in the context of uh, Berlinale. And, um, and yeah, I've been screened in 20 places during that COVID time, including the New York Film Festival, but also in Trinidad and Tobago, in Martinique, in different places. And so that film is for me the kind of um, the most developed uh, form of what I was looking for by making a film company. It was not to, to be able to smoke cigars and to have a big black car, especially because I can't drive, but which is the purpose of the most people who are talking about the film production. It was most to try to create something that uh, able to fly from what we consider cinema is towards what I call the commonplace, which is a place that no, without any master. So is a film is able to fly from itself in certain sort of way. In, uh, in, with the idea of non-representing something except what it can't represent. So in that film, there is a lot of conversation passing by and I will share you just one thing happened in the film. It's a band of young people rehearsing a, a play about uh, the historical era of the Haitian Revolution called Toussaint Louverture. And they are, real, they are doing, trying to adapt the play in Haitian Creole, the play is in French, that have been written by Edouard Glissant. And so they try to adapt it and the more they try to, they, they have conversation. And in the process of the film, we made the play and beside the play, in, in, a, in, in the bus coming from here to there, in the evening drinking beer, so there is a lot of side conversation of the, of, the, of the group of people that work with us. And I propose them to have all those conversations in the film instead of be, beside the film. So all the beside the film pass by the film. It doesn't stay in the film, but it pass by. So, you will hear one of the conversation what was a side conversation one evening and the day after I asked to the two person concerned by the conversation is it possible to restate it as you want for the film and it began when you want and finish when you want and you can say what you want but I think it has to be in the film and it is in the film. I try to share it, I hope I will succeed in it. Mm -hmm. So, do you see my screen, the images or not? Not yet. Not yet, okay. So I think I have to share the screen before. Okay, yeah. You see it now? Yes. Okay, it's cool. Yeah, it's five minutes of conversation. Uh, I think I'll, I'll share it with the sound. Uh, just tell me if you hear the sound. Do yes. Hear? Okay, yes. Okay, cool. So come on. Faites parler de, de, de citoyens du monde là, même tout bien un peu, un peu utopique. Et dans ce sens, côté que l'autre de ces citoyens du monde, pour moi, c'est lié tout aux originaux, c'est lié toutes les catégories sociales pour appartenir avec eux-mêmes, c'est lié aux catégories culturelles. Tout le monde trouve des idées qui flottent. Hein. C'est-à-dire que c'est une espèce de fuite, fuite de responsabilité, peut-être raciale, culturelle, économique, parce que. On est, on est homme que par l'homme, tu vois, donc à chaque grand monde qui existait ici, il y a une catégorie sociale. Bon, on a les plus loin, on a une catégorie culturelle, donc tous ces citoyens du monde, même trouvé un peu utopique, bon, pas même biaisé, mais c'est utopique comme, comme, comme idée. En fait, déjà, je trouve que, que c'est génial qu'on fait remarquer ça. Et souvent, vraiment, on comprend comme ça. Mais au fait, euh, 
dis que c'est citoyen du monde, c'est pas que nier origine moi ou bien oublier ou bien fuir responsabilité en quelque sorte. Au contraire, responsabilité de voir c'est chercher l'autre horizon, c'est aller joindre aller joindre des autres espaces, découvrir des autres bagages et c'est dans l'idée ça même d'ailleurs qui fait me dire c'est citoyen du monde. Non, mais à l'heure mais chercher chercher l'autre espace ouvrir Et pour me continuer, je voulais dire que ça au fait ne pas ne pas résumer, ne pas étiquette et ne pas identifier directement par rapport avec l'origine. D'abord, on va identifier par rapport avec qui ça m'y est, ça que je comme bagage et, et en tant qu'être humain, quoi, rapport, rapport humaniste. Non? Même tout même ne pas trouver l'humaniste, je plus trouver l'individualiste, parce que il y a l'autre. Parce que c'est peut-être ou même dans tête pas identifié par rapport avec tel. Telle, telle ou telle chose, mais l'autre, il est identifié par rapport à mon bagage. Donc, on a pour exemple qui est simple. Donc, au Sénat, il y a un pays côté que le racisme lui-même est en branle. Donc, mais t'es noir, en fait. T'es noir, donc il y a beaucoup comme noir. Et ceci, il y a des barèmes qui ont construit parce qu'il est noir. Donc, en quoi on n'est que vous mettez une étiquette raciale sur lui Bon, pas seulement raciale, mais des fois qui est purement coloriste. En quoi on est consacré à dire, bon, bon, même moi, je en France, donc, bon, je suis citoyen du monde, donc, je considère mon tant que tel. C'est peut-être, c'est dans tête au lié. Est-ce que pas purement individualiste Parce qu'il y a l'autre. On est, on est homme que par l'homme. Tu peux pas exister sans l'autre, mon mieux. Même, même, pas non, pas non, on va cosmopolitisme, parce que pour moi, c'est flou. C'est une espèce de déni. Même pas la donne, puisque nos bagages origine, nos bagages africanité, nos bagages, nos bagages qui, 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 plus ou moins noiriste. Mm -hmm. bon, c'est la donne moyenne pour qui ça Parce que je comprends que. C'est un bail qui est naturel quand l'homme, la peur de la différence, la peur de l'inconnu. Donc, nous ne pouvons pas comme ça, c'est naturel quand l'homme. Mais tellement bagarre grave naturel, mais nous ne voulons créer un bail qui est culturel, qui est théorie implicite de la personnalité. Donc, mm -hmm. parce que je suis noir, donc on me considère comme, 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 comme un voyou, parce que je suis pauvre, bon genre, je suis parce que parce que aussi dans une catégorie sociale bien déterminée. Ensemble de bagarre que je ne gagner. Appel là, c'est qui ça C'est être humain, c'est pas. Ce n'est pas noir, ce n'est pas blanc, ce n'est pas... Bah, c'est on vit ensemble, c'est... Et puis d'ailleurs, moi je trouve que l'utopie, hein, j'en sorti le talé, c'est mon bail qui est impossible. Ça qui est impossible, c'est la situation de vivre Kounia, la situation où les gens ne pensent pas Kounia, c'est impossible. L'utopie, c'est accepter le bail, accepter le qui fait... Jusqu'à présent, nous trouvons que bon, voilà, c'est un bail futile. Genre. Mais quand on a tout, tout dit, on dit comme ça, bon, en fait, l'idée d'être cosmopolite ou bien d'être citoyen du monde, mm -hmm. est-ce que qu'on a la abouti, la, 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 la bail en bon aboutissement Est-ce que qu'on a pas qu bien des, des, des divisions qui existaient dans l'idée comme cosmopolitisme là, on a? Et Oui, moi, être comme cosmopolite, est-ce que l'autre là, être comme cosmopolite Déjà, négliger l'autre, c'est négliger soi-même. Négliger tête, c'est négliger l'autre. En étant ainsi, ça va l'interpeller, ça va faire appel, la caille, la va dire, bon voilà, mais qui sont en réalité, et c'est son doué, mais pas ça, au bas ou Non, pour moi, je ne pas comme ça. Même si c'est l'idée d'être citoyen du monde, plus qu'elle comme, plus qu comme, yon, comme yon, la, la, la négligence de l'autre. Et c'est comme si c'est la négligence de soi-même, et parce que c'est pour tout négliger l'autre là. Ou oublier son yéa. Mais non! Parce que l'autre n'a pas du son yéa, carrément. Parce que l'autre n'a pas le du son yéa. L'autre n'a pas le du son yéa. Mais l'autre n'a pas le du son yéa. L'autre n'a sa société a dit yéa. L'autre n'a pas le ça et avec un ensemble de règles, de lois, bah on est dans la communauté qui est vivant là, identifier. L'autre n'a pas le répéter même bêtise. Mais c'est là, c'est là pour. L'autre n'a pas le répéter même bêtise là. On ne pas casser toi-même du monde là. Ça te fait ça? Parce que parce que son son utopie. Il pas en utopie. Son idée, son idée utopique. C'est un bail qui est tout à fait réel. C'est tout à fait réel. Bon. Ok. You hear me? Yeah. Ok. Yeah, so that was uh, an example of film ouverture that that should be screened in uh, Goldsmiths in the next spring. This is a project. Uh, and normally, if everything goes well, I hope with, uh, we will be after the, the worst moment of COVID and it will be a presidential presentation with a part of the team. This is a project we begin to talk uh, with people in Goldsmiths.
So I hope who will make next spring to share that thing for real, I would, I would say. That's it for, for on my side, just to introduce a lot of different things. It's a bit difficult to, 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 to go through so many questions like that, but I think perhaps we can, we're gonna keep on, uh, I'm gonna have a conversation now to, uh, to clarify some point if I haven't been yeah. clear now. Thank you, Olivia. I'm really glad we saw the film. It's really, it's fantastic. Um, I, might, I might get in touch with you to get those two guys to do another lecture for us. <laughs> it's a really fantastic discussion. Could you just, um, I kind of, I think I missed what, what's the, what's the overall, what's the film about overall? Yeah, the film is globally about a theatre company in Haiti that trying to, to stage a play about Edouard Lisson called Monsieur Toussaint. Okay. Right. about the story of revolution but in fact is the beginning of the film but the film is is uh, expanding in some other way to a lot right. of if other questions from that that first question what was uh, is there any uh, revolutionary spirit still vivid in Haiti today and i can answer that question really easily yes right and and these so these two guys are Part of the art, part of the theatre company. The yeah, the part of the theatre. Yeah, but I think that everybody in the film is playing a role in itself at the same time. So it's also, I think, for me, uh, a real um, perspective about the notion of minority and again the necessity of uh, of what modern called the, the the performance of blackness. That mean that you on, on not only you, you are always also performing something. Mm -hmm. And my idea is also the necessity of creating a kind of stage of your life. So Uberto is really playing with that kind of uh, that kind of uh, issue of creating a kind of space of a stage for your life uh, that it could be a kind of uh, arena for uh, a collectivity. So the film is talking and playing that at the same time, I would say. Yeah, okay. Um, I see there are a few questions. I'm gonna ask you one just to, you know, we stitch together the end of your talk in the beginning mm -hmm. and bring up some of the, I don't know, the larger issues rather than specifics. Um, so I think this issue of staging your life sounds to me, um, you, know, you can relate that to the point you were making during your talk about the pledge to be in a different position. Mm. In a way, the film allows the protagonist to be in a different, like to, to be in a double position between mm. who they are outside of the film and who they are inside of the film. Um, and I see the, you know, when you were describing what you did at Chiasma, it also seemed to be, well, kind of like an exhibition space, but what seemed really important for you was that it was a, a, a staging for encounters. Mm. between different people, but also between people in images, people in narratives, and between different narratives as well, not all of which are autobiographical, some of them are speculative, some of them are this kind of double, double staging that you were just talking about. Um, and that, so, so I was quite struck at the beginning when you're talking about, um, you know, being from what, from the French Empire gets called the periphery. Mm. And, and how you phrase that as um, the problem with that, it's, it's the deep history of it, it's the politics of it, but to conceptualize that, you, can't, you called it a scene of representation. And the challenge for you at the beginning was not just how you enter into the scene of representation, but how you, how you avoid it, how you negate it, how you go by its side, how you undermine it, and so on. Right? So it's not to, as you said, you're, there's no point being another king or another queen, because the mm. scene of representation keeps going, even if it's you know like a minority person in in that position. Um, so it's it's more about the, I guess I guess what, what I draw from your talk is you're setting up on the one hand this kind of imperial notion of a scene of representation with a center, and on the other hand the one that you're endorsing and have made the staging which doesn't fall into that scene of representation. Um, and just to kind of bring it back to the contemporary art, uh, you know, the contemporary art discussion, partly because 
of the pragmatics of the program. People come to Goldsmiths because they want to enter into like a professional art system where we're uh, you know, a recognized channel for people to do that. But I think one of the issues that's coming up for me thinking about this series is actually what, what do we sign up to when we do that? Um, and so I was, I was kind of trying to, um, in a way, ask what, what is the, what is the um, capacity for contemporary art to do staging, as you're describing it? And there's a lot of you know, efforts to uh, kind of work through communities, set up a uh, space of encounters, um, and in a sense, you know, some of the, from the images anyway, some of the uh, exhibitions that you had wouldn't look out of place in a contemporary art zone. But there seems to be something very specific in, in what, you were, what you were discussing, which was the effort was not just about what gets exhibited, but about who meets whom in the spaces that you set up, right? So you're very clear, it's not an exhibition space in which people arrive to see something. It's a space in which people meet by coming to look at something, which is a different, a different activity. So I think what I, what I go ahead. Yeah, just to say that I think the separation you do is also linked to a certain conception of what the representation is. And I will say, firstly, coming for the poetry, and I will talk more specifically about the carbon context. You have to remember so some precise point of the history also to consider that new entry in the contemporary visual practice. And the first one is that the separation of, in between the subject you look at and or the object you look at and the subject, the, the production of subjectivity in the Western context is really specific. I'm coming from the modern culture well, the relationship in and like indigenous culture, the relationship in between the so-called nature and the humanity is not separate. You don't look at something is not you. Your whole body is in relation with something, but there is not that cultural observation of something that has been separated, separate from your body. And so the visual culture and the importance of the visual in the, the, the Western mm -hmm. epistemology of the modernity is linked to the separation between human and non-human. So it creates that display of going to a show is looked to something is not you. In my sociability, going to the show is also be in relation with other bodies, not only looking to things, not only using my eyes as the main uh, tool that I've got to feel things, which is really for me, the, the enemy church of the, of the Western uh, uh, modernity, that the high is dominant as not, and not the rest of the body to know things. And the other things is that what you have to consider is you as a subject that sees something. And the notion with the Kantian notion of reason is really considered, is really a way to build a kind of autonomous subject able to sense the world and the world existing cause and look at it. But I don't consider that. I don't consider the world exists is existing cause I look at it. The world is existing in me, outside of me, in relation with me. So it's more a culture of relation, which is not less visual. What I'm calling cinema is all the performances, the image production possible through relationship in between human, non-human context. But there is no landscape, for instance, in the Caribbean uh, culture. Because remember that people have to have learned to disappear in the so-called landscape to survive. When you spend a part of your life as a matter, as a resources for the white capitalism, you became, you become something else. And you don't have the desire to be on the center of representation as you don't have to be, have the desire to be a Western subject. Is the way back to the thing, as we says, outside of the object and come back to the thing in the uh, such a kind of collection of matter. And when I says I try to dismantle the desire to be the Western subject, it's not against that. It's really an issue of imagination and an issue of desire. I try to reorient my desire to, to, towards something else, which is also an ecological concept. 
I, I, I try to reorient my, my feelings in relation with the, the climate, in relation with the environment, instead of my desire to be a Western subject. That goes that to the destroy the world we're living in. So it's more a kind of way of being in such a kind of let's talk about the ecology of the art fields and not as a thematic but as a practice. How to do not to be toxic to answer to your question. How to do not to be toxic. So let's take what we don't want to be and not only what we dream to be. When people are coming to Goldsmiths for visual art department, which is quite famous and our department is too, is with a desire to be. But people have to be able to come also with a certain kind of desire not to be and with another kind of imagination, but not refuse to come, come with that. And uh, as you know, I really defend that the practice of refusal as uh, a positive practice. We have to learn to be with, but not accepting with, so I can, I talk, about the sense of consent and what people ask to the people of color and all the minority now on the Western sense of representation is to consent to be there. And I don't, I don't consent to it. And I feel that refusal, it adds totally the, that world to, to find new well-being. It's not refusal to participate, it's refuse to consent to an existing sense. So for me, the art world doesn't exist in certain way. Mm. It's, it's an issue of imagination. It doesn't exist. It's what you, you want it to be. So I'm not entering in the world because I'm not entering in the sense of representation. I'm coming with my own sense. And my body and my friends and people, we are a sense. So we can come. As you saw in the, the expert of Ouverture, finally, the images and the scene is making by the two guys talking. It's not as a mise en scene in the scene. They are creating the scene. And in the, for instance, in the West Africa, there is a French expression that, that says when people got, you know, a, a camera, people got in front of you, they, do you want I make you a photograph? That's mean, do you, with my body, I'm gonna make an image for you and you don't make an image for me. So it's my presence that creating the condition of an image. And I do think that we have to be really confident in that thing. Because if the sense of representation is not populated, it doesn't exist anymore. OK, um, I, I'd like to go a bit further, but I see there's a bunch of questions for you. So I'm going to ask James to uh, kind of lead, lead on the questions. OK, so I'd just like to repeat what Suhail said earlier in that when you're asking your question, please put your video on so everyone can see you and Olivia can see you. Um, I'm going to group some of these questions together, which means that maybe two people will ask their questions and then Olivia will answer that pair. So the first, the first ones I'd like um, Rita Moraes and then Eloise Chespo. Uh, so maybe Rita could go first. <laughs> okay, so well, maybe Eloise can go first. Just yeah, sorry. Oh, go Eloise, then I can go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just having a problem. Uh, I'm... Uh, there is yeah, a it's going to be back. better now. Um, I'm with people around from Goldsmiths and we are all looking at you at the same time. So it's echoing all over the room. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a kind of technical or logi logistical question. And it's quite uh, precise, but I was wondering how did you found it? And how did you finance your project of a publish like edition project at the right beginning and how your art center is uh, financed as well is if you if you re received like uh, money for government or and if you also found that it was more and more simpler for you to get money from government 
uh, with throughout the years, if you felt like the public answer uh, was a bit more, um, um, how can I say that? Uh, if you felt like the political reaction was more and more open to your uh, project, or if you felt some resistance to to find a finance for your project. Yeah, the first thing uh, the, the, the first I, I can answer to that one, James. So you think uh, I should wait for the, another one? Well, the second question was also a kind of uh, more technical question, so I thought maybe we could hear that one as well. Okay, cool. Rita. Rita. Okay. Hi. I Hi. hope it's working now. Um, yeah, my question was about, I mean, just if you could maybe give us a few more words about your collective process as I've been reading and following uh, overtures. I really like the film, but it's always signed up as signed as directed by um, the ensemble. Um, so maybe you could tell us a bit more about how that process actually happens while um, constructing the film. I mean, by from producing to editing, I guess. Thank you. Well. Yeah, the, the two questions, we can spend a lot of hours to answer to that. Thank you for that really nice question. I, I, will, I will be short if you want to uh, hear to everybody. So I think it's super interesting and super important to talk about the publisher at the beginning because I'm writing a text for uh, a South African magazine called Shimurenga, you may know about the process of that first part of my life as a publisher. And, um, and uh, I don't know the word in English, but the title in French is Muscle et Perruque. A perruque is something you put on your head and, and the muscles. That means about the, the, the Hammock things. So the Hammock project I've been made with uh, the first results was our body with evil. And so it has been our time, our body, but we found it using a technical call in the working class, the perrucage. And peruk uh, is the, what uh, Walker is doing, uh, doing is uh, uh, the time when he's not walking with the machine. And sometimes the worker used the machine that were working all the days to build some little things for them or for the children. And that technical uh, struggle, really small struggle called to do a peruk, fair in peruk. That means that you use the, the, the machine of the capital just to produce something else than something for the capital. It's really simple for me, and I'm writing a long text about that, because all the resources of the publisher at the beginning have to be used on the, uh, make some uh, photocopy in office of friends, using some papers, learned uh, serigraphy here, and all the books we did with, uh, with uh, Ivan and the five first years of Amok, which are really precious for us, and now they are in the National uh, Library in France. They have made and made one by one without any money. And this is the part of my life I'm the most proud of. After that, I did things with much more money, which is really problematic. But that first part is really the inheritance of being from the outskirts. We, we didn't have any money to do anything. It's just using, you know, as it in office, there was a uh, you can make a photocopy there, and so I make some books. Some of them are really famous, made like, like that, coming at night, asking your friends if you can help for that, that and learning. And so with, with uh, Eva at that time, until now, for me, each process of making is a process of learning something. So it's super important also not to say, I'm going to do something because I learned how to do it well. I never learned to do anything well in my life even as producer, as creator, as writer. I never learned anything well, because I think we have to queer the, the way of doing things if we want to do our own space to breathe. So I mislearn in a way. It's not even de-learn, unlearn, it's mislearn. But that mislearning, it, it has been super efficient for me, and it's really my artistic signature. And say about the collective, I will just to, to answer to Rita's questions. 
I would say is that the collective have been a process of living together and build a relation together. Normally, when you're making a movie, you met people, you do things. Since four years, we met several times in the years with the collective, and we are doing what people are doing when they are all together. We are inventing films without preparing them. And so it's a permanent conversation on what to do today, the day after. And it's more for me, and it's really an image of the feminist practice, is more an issue of attention for me. Uh, I'm one of the person writing in the collective, and my writing is based on the memorization of conversations. So there is no invention. It is the, the life of the collective life creating some post potential sin, and we are making it collectively that way. But I think that really often in the Western context, there is a kind of obsession of the collective organization as a kind of uh, masterpiece, you know, the organization itself. I think the base of the living and dead ensemble is the cows, because we main people from, uh, from the Caribbean. And so the way of speaking is a cacophony, the way of organizing is a cows. But the pleasure to live in a certain kind of cows. We, and the rules are built in respect of each of us, but there is also the dynamic of the group that could be late on the night and early in the morning and going there and there. And so that's it. It's a kind of organic process of being together, but it's also caring about each other in everyday life. That means that sometimes people need money to do that, that, that. So we're creating a project to have money to live. So it's really that kind of vivid process, I would say. But over two will be screened at Goldsmiths in spring, so we'll have more time to talk more about that. I want to, okay. Okay, then. Um, I think the next question I'd like would be from uh, Jean Francois. Uh, but I'd just like to remind everybody that have your video on while you're asking the question, and also while Olivier is replying to you so he can see who he's replying to. Uh, is Jean-François there? Uh, yes, yeah. So uh, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I would like to go back to something <clears throat> you are introducing in uh, your text, An Invisible Common. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, the oceanic approach. Uh, and I thought it was a very beautiful analogy to the periphery. Um, the ocean as a space. Uh, so I, I would like you actually to say a few words maybe on that. Yeah, the really simplest way is that to consider the way you are coming from an island, the ground is the sea. So there is a kind of opposition of, for instance, you know, part of my family, and my, my, my second name, Mohana, is coming from Tahiti. Yeah. And in the Polynesia, imagine there is a territory is as big as Europe, but only made by water. So that means that we, we have, that, we have to, to, to get that imagination of they are living in the same side of territory than Europe, but it's, we call it Micronesia because we only point, you know, the small islands, but it's territory made by sea. And so I think the idea of the, uh, the, idea of the ocean approach is an idea of also a counter narrative. That means that you can look at the map of the world looking at the sea instead of the continent and considering that, that the ground is the periphery of the world. So it's really that, that kind of uh, idea of a perspective. And I think we have all been educated in the Western context to have a certain perspective on things. And we have to spend more time to build for us, each of us, a really more specific perspective that help us to live. If some concept doesn't help you to live well, that means that you have to, to invent other concepts to live your relationship with the world. And of course, I think, I think what is really important that I've also also on the chat, people think that center versus periphery. There is no versus. It's exactly not that. There is no, the periphery is not the periphery of a center. It's try to reorganize the desire for periphery as an ocean doesn't care about itself uh, in relation with the continent. It says, I'm the ocean of a continent. It's just I'm an ocean. So the periphery is more the, the way of, of living you can build um, on, on, the, on the side, you know, 
but not cause there is a center, not in relation with the center, not with a, a, any kind of angriness against center, to try to reorganize and redirect the desire to other spaces, just that. And, to, and don't to lose your time with some scene of representation that are toxic for you. Don't spend time in the toxicity. So care of yourself and care of your, of your kin and try to create other places. And it, well, I think it's really a useful lesson for the periphery because in time in France, the periphery become more and more important when they care about themselves as a cultural space and not as the border of the center. Much. Um, I just want to say that probably we've got 15 minutes left uh, before we need to finish. So I'm going to ask one more person, uh, which I, th I think I'll ask Maria Yoranko, uh, who asked a few different questions, but maybe they can summarize their questions or just give the ones that they're interested in right now. Can you see? Yes. So I accidentally sent a bunch of questions, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, my sorry about that. Um, I think you answered a good amount of them, but I think the one that is most interest that I would like to know more about is um, your position of developing language, because we're using a language that has been given to us, whether it's French, English, or however, as like a universal communication language and how we're communicating with each other now. How do you go about um, reusing or refitting that language that we have to suit needs that it's not meant to suit, if, if that makes sense. Or how do you um, build, a, build a language that still works within those frames of English or whatever language and, um, you know, becomes in concert with community and builds a holistic way of communicating with people in a way that suits their needs. Yeah. Does that make sense? I'm sorry. Yeah, but I will try to answer, perhaps answer uh, uh, in a wrong way. But I think first thing is that we are got an imagination based on a certain language, okay? Uh, only, um, I only write in French. All my texts in English are translation. I never write in English because um, um, I got my personal struggle with French which is something really my intimacy. And so when the translator walk with me, because I can't speak English, uh, she always says, okay, but in French, it doesn't mean anything to write that. She says, yes, so you have to try to translate it, that problematic of language in English. So sometimes I got a relationship so intimate with French that I can brutalize French, you know, and through Creole expression, through, through. and so, in between French and English is not so complicated because we can make translation at some point, even if there is always an untranslability in between language. But in, when you jump from understand from French to Creole or Creole to French, it's not the system, same system of language because Creole is a visual language. It's, uh, it's a language of emergency. People create Creole to speak really quickly about something that's happening because they were love living in the danger. And so my relationship in between Creole and French is that I, I, I had a life under the, the trees of, of the state violence. And I'm speaking French like uh, I can speak Creole, other people can speak Creole with a certain kind of urgency, considering that the most important thing is to be, to, to create some shortcuts in the sense. So I think that practice of language uh, uh, open us to the possibility of to treat, uh, to speak and to work with the language it chose to do is the case with the collective uh, uh, living in that ensemble. Everybody keep the more comfortable languages that they need to use to talk. And we have to deal with that. Because I think we always need to simplify things in a lot of issue of communication. But of course, in heart, we never have to care about simplification. Art is a complex thing, so we don't never have to simplify anything. If there is an issue of communication, um, we have to practice it instead of simplify it. And I always says that everybody has to keep his own languages. Okay, it's practical to speak English to, to, to go to Goldsmiths and elsewhere. 
but I don't think that people have to speak the course make English everywhere in the world. I consider that each place have to speak its own languages and we don't have to switch to another one. Or we have to accept the kind of um, um, misunderstanding. I always say to answer to the question of collectivity, there is no collectivity for me, no assembly without misunderstanding. That misunderstanding are for me the base of what a community is. It's really the opposite that people think. The transparency of language doesn't open to assembly. An assembly is based on a misunderstanding. So we have to keep that different level of understanding that we have about the world. Or, and so, of course, with Ouverture, we are also practicing the poetry, which is for me the, the, the transition in between the visual and the, and the words. So poetry is the visual aspect of the languages. So, so that's it. Great. Um, we've got a tiny bit of time left. So then I thought I would ask um, Juliette Pepin and there's a slightly anonymous person called 2M1WYI uh, <laughs> who asked the most recent question. So maybe Juliette uh, could go first and then the anonymous person after that. It, I think there is two Juliettes, so I'm not sure which one. You, I'm talking about Juliette Pepin. All right, um, my question is rather dense, so I already apologize for the, the time remaining, but I was wondering like when you, if working with the idea of like uh, knowledge generation and knowledge transmission from a, an outskirt, although you mentioned that there shouldn't be a dualism between outskirt and center, I was wondering, also considering the current uh, situation with, uh, let's say, policing knowledge from the French Minister of Education and also like the, the situation with Goldsmith with the accusations, how like is the university still an image of the centering of knowledge? And can it still like, do you think it, well, I mean, it's a very broad question, but do you think it can still also be this place for um, peripheral knowledge uh, and discussion within the political now? I mean, super, mm, yeah, super broad. I think that question has to be asked that people concerned by the university. But as I told you, I don't use my imagination for space I'm not working in because mm, yeah. I don't I, I don't use my energy in the wrong way because we don't have so much energy so much time so much so I do think that if the university want to be the center of something they have to care about that I think the yeah I think there is that issue of policing I really defend in the something really simple is to be able to be present in some space without uh, having to defend ourselves of, of, of being or having a criminal life. And as Judith Butler says, I want a good life even if it's a criminal life for you. So I think I'm really defending that, coming from the Oscar saying, I'm not here to prove you that I'm not a criminal. I don't know, you are living in a system that produced me as a criminal, and I, that, I don't want to spend time to explain you why I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you consider me as a criminal, it's an option for me being a criminal. It's not a problem, it's a problem for you. You are producing criminal. I'm living with criminals, so part of my family is in your sense. And we got criminal life, as queer life, our criminal life for other people. So I think we spend too much time uh, in the, uh, as we said in the Caribbean context, in the high of the other, the whiteness, is that high where we're spending, and it's a patriarchal, uh, patriarchal high. So I, I would like to uh, really stress that point that perhaps I didn't stress enough for me, is that the whiteness is also patriarchy, it's something that is specifically uh, related to the gender too. It's also a way of looking at things through uh, gender, race, and, and class things at the same time. I don't want to spend my time in that case. I really don't care. And I think when you say I don't care about that case, which is obsessed to be in the center of everything, then they move. More than when you, you try to struggle against them. Says, I just don't care about you. And then they move. 
And people says, ask me before, is it, has that been difficult or not difficult to do what to do? Since I, I decided to do my thing without trying to change them, so they came to you and they asked you to talk. And so that moment I says, what do you do when they open the door and you don't have to pass by the windows? It's the beginning of a new story. What's happening when they open the door? It says, I never ask you to be inside. Yeah, but I open you the door. Come on. The French ministry asked me, Olivier, you are an example for so many people. You have to come here to talk in our report there. That. I don't have time to be an active informant. I don't have time for that. And that moment of refusal is the beginning of a new story. If you accept at that moment what I call the narcissistic trap, you lose your time. You have to insist. It says, I refused in the past. You didn't invite me. And now you invite me, but I'm not your Negro. I'm not, I'm not here to come when you ask me to come. I got other people to care about. So to reorient your desire to all the object is for me the central idea of the talk. All right, um, Olivia, I'm kind of worried about overworking you, but there are, there are kind of three, three questions that because I'm cool, you know, I, I'm cool, it's more, more you, I think, uh, yeah, for me, I'm cool, I think it's, it's nice to talk with you, and I think it's nice to share either, so it's your decide when you decide this end, but I think it's nice if people have questions, let's, let's go right. on, that's cool. That's, that's really nice. Um, I think we just take the next three questions in a row, and then if you could just, like, answer that, and then we'll maybe finish with that. So there's, there's sorry, James, like, there were two questions about whiteness, and I saw a question from Giuseppe as well. So can you remind me who? So shall we have the first uh, Juliet? Juliet G G M P. Yes. Thank you very much. You can see how it's Oh, we get double James. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, amazing talk. Um, I just had a question. Um, yeah, we were saying it's a lot of French people asking questions. So my mom is also from the Paris suburb. And I was really interested to know how would you translate the term uh, whiteness in French? Because it seems like uh, UK has more ability to, to address those issues. But what, when it comes to French language, it's kind of an issue. Like we don't say blancheur. I've never seen that in any articles. So how would you, yeah, what is your opinion about this, this sort of taboo being present in French and not UK. Okay, now, well, there's another question about whiteness, so we'll just... mm. mysterious 2M1. Okay, nice. No. Oh, sorry, it's me. I didn't realize I, I, I had I <laughs> attended anonymously. Um, yeah, I was just really, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, it was, um, yeah, brilliant, very inspiring. Uh, it struck me that throughout that um, you talked a lot about uh, the space, the importance of space, and um, this idea of kind of, well, as, as I interpreted it, um, like kind of uh, owning the space or shaping the space, like almost like as an extension of yourself. Um, and I wondered if this was um, this, this desire or focus uh, came from a sense that uh, space as you typically um, have encountered it, uh, somehow um, didn't represent, was typically didn't represent you or your experiences or you know, your ideas. Um, and I suppose on the back of that, I was wondering to what extent do you feel um, whiteness like dominates space? And uh, I wondered if, if you could, if you had any thoughts on on um, how how can a place or space be white and how can it be uh, if you find a space kind of like um, overwhelmingly um, uh, 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 yeah if, if it's overwhelmingly white how can it be redressed if this it has a kind of um, if whiteness predominates how can that space then be kind of yeah redressed? Great, thank you. Maybe that could lead into Giuseppe's question. Point. Hello. Hey. Hey, Olivia. Uh, thank you for your talk. That was really dope, and I'm I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm happy that you that you talked that you did your thing. 
Um, so my question is about imagination. And I like this idea that um, I think I heard you mention about imagination as a tool for, uh, for world building, but also maybe existing outside of systems of confinement. Um, and perhaps an imagination that stops fetishizing representation, um, such as maybe like, you know, American tropes as like maybe the Obama administration or something and like actual and, and honors actual black liberation, right? Um, and I'm thinking you now more about maybe also like imprisonment and people like George Jackson who utilize this type of imagination um, as a way to escape, as a way of liberty. Um, and I guess my question, for, for, for you or, or maybe just something, maybe a, a thought is how do we house this type of imagination, um, this, this, this resistance um, within academia and if we even need to house it within there um, and how do we articulate that type of imagination? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Thank yeah, so I can answer to that one so, so for the threshold one to the and come back to the whiteness and the white space. Thank you for your question. All are, are really inspiring too. First thing I have to say is that uh, I accept that invitation by Suhail to keep on walking and I considering that I'm trying to frame my own idea talking with you. I'm not here to teach you something. But I'm to also to to keep on walking, and so I like the conversation because it helped me also to, in relation with other uh, feelings, question, and imagination, to build something. So I think we never walk alone. To, to answer to the question of academia is that I think all space called uh, and it's come back to the authentic approach. I will say it's all place called something outside of us. And the outside of it is also the space. So I think it's no use to think the academia are something that is totally uh, without any porosity to the society. There is no academia as a bubble in the, the academia is in London, the academia is in the in the West, West Indies, the academia is, is somewhere first. So that kind of role of academia I will see, you know, the global uh, academia, I don't believe in that at all. And it can relate to the, I will go jump to the first uh, remarks that have been uh, said by Juliet about the translation of whiteness. Uh, I don't really care about translating whiteness or about translating blackness because the construction of a whiteness in France and the construction of the blackness in France is really specific. And the specificity is really what we have to work on. That means that, for instance, the blackness in France include Arabic people, which is not the case in the state, for instance. We are very specific uh, um, colonial stories that create also the Roma people, for instance, as for me, black people are part of that blackness. And so the term of blackness for me, for instance, is blinding a, a class issue, for instance. And so that created a kind of also an issue of the black bourgeoisie in the state, for instance, that I don't feel close to. And uh, when, when uh, just, just before Wizipe talked about Obama, uh, I was not so happy to, uh, to have a so-called black president uh, in the state, because I think for me, the blackness is also a performance of a certain kind of fragility. So I think there is a trap with that kind of terms and the difficulty to translate them should advise us to not to use them so easily and to try to build more complex expression. So I'm talking about the white body of reference instead of blackness, the corps blanc de référence. That means it's not all the white body, it's typically the kind of white body that is uh, obsessed by its centrality and it's also the body which in the contact with you compare your humanity, you know. So this is the heritage of the modernity, considering that the white people are the people and the other people are less the people. So this is not only say whiteness, but notion of reference for me is super important. And also I'm talking about the body uh, instead of identity, for instance. And I talk a lot of my friend, a scholar, American and British scholar about that my use of body instead of identity, considering that there is always a, a certain kind of performance. And 
So it's not a kind of essentialization of what the analyst is. The analyst is a performance and if you, it's a specific body in a specific context. And so it was just to say is that in a certain way, um, talking about the academia, we have to, to consider that now in the global world, the academia is overconnect with the West, the rest of the world and the temptation not to be connect with is a problem. But I will say we got a really specific situation in France where there is two problems, but one of the most important for me is the difficulties for the academics to be in relation with the activists. I think in the UK, since throughout all and other people, the notion of uh, a certain category of knowledge coming from the activists for, I don't know, uh, the queer people, people from different community, it's a kind of value that academics can understand. It's not the case in the French context. They still have that kind of uh, this desire of purity of knowledge of the academia beside other category of knowledge, you know, for the activists, for, yeah, all the category of activists. So it's still a struggle to make people understand that there is different knowledge production and knowledge, uh, a knowledge constellation, specifically about minority. And so there was some specialists of minority in the academy. They don't want to invite or talk with people being engaged with their body, with their life, with that kind of danger of being a minority in the, yeah, in, in the everyday life. So this is more a problem for me, but just to stress uh, what Juliet asked, I think when there is a problem of translation, there is often more than a problem of translation. If it's not easy to you to have fine whiteness in France, that means that there is something. And so that means that we have to work more, find more precise terms. And also we have to, to, to try to understand why we need so simple expression to talk. I think the complexity of the language is really, uh, is really a kind of treasure that we have, even if our language is fragile. So I don't think, I think it is, there is a tension in between studying, for instance, in the uh, Anglo-American uh, conceptual and language for people coming from France. And so I like there is a problem that means that is not the same perspective. And so there is a lot of dialogue, as I told you, when my texts are translated, when my translator says, shit, Olivia, but that doesn't exist in English to say that. So we have to spend time and uh, for instance, uh, we talk about that text, an invisible common, which in French is called un populaire invisible. And my translator says, yes, but popular in French means we can translate in popular in English. It doesn't mean the same thing. And so we spend time and trying to find something that could open the same kind of imagination. And so that time of translation is a time also of learning about some context. If as a French person, you have to, to work in the context of goldsmiths, you have to inform people about the French context and your difficulty to find the right term in French. So it's not a problem, it's more something that you, you bring on the table is to be the same for Spanish speak, uh, speaking people extra. So we have to consider that the difficulty we have to fit in that kind of global language is a sign that we need more words than the global language, that's all. And just to answer really quickly to the question of the space, I would say that for me, the white space is a space with a center. That means that we are gathering around a center, around something. And the non-white space in general, which is not an issue of color, but an issue of performance, is a space where nobody is a center and nobody is more human than other people. Nobody is more human. And so even we can have desire to be a criminal life, even we can, uh, have, we can come with desire of being a, a resource or a form of matter and speaking from the perspective of an object for former slave, for instance. So there is no the centrality of the white humanity that we have to, we, there is other way of being, other way of saying, other way of, of feeling that can be expressed. So, and really often I think that the problem with the white space is that they want to have everybody in the same space at the same time. 
they don't consider that some life and some voices have to be protected to be pronounced. So they create that idea of universalism based on everybody and the same space, which could be super violent for a part of us. And they don't want to consider it what I call the, the white innocence or the white ignorance. That they think that is super generous to say we are have all to stand on the same space as if it will be an image in their imagination, the image of the world. While the world is built with different places, different way of being with. And we can't always be in the same space at the same moment. That's why that uh, different kind of being there, being silent, being hidden, being ear and heart, all that way of being have to be considered in the space of the commons to come, which is not the white space. The white space is the fake horizontality, which is the lights on uh, some life that need to be hidden to live and to breathe. Wow, great. Olivia, thank you. That's uh, just to kind of like launch the, launch the talks with this notion of what happens otherwise than I guess we could call it like a whiteness cube instead of the white cube. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's really great. Thank you. Um, just, you know, it's just it's like amazing way to start the start the talks. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna. I know you want to carry on. <laughs> it's already late. I'm worried about your dinner and so on. Um, I'm I'm really cool. Though. If okay. somebody has I'm a good question, because yeah, I'm worried about my dinner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think it's you that making decision because it's, it can be late for some of you. So right. I think when you decide is that it's still five minutes before eight, let's say we stop at eight or last last things. Um, okay, I think I think most questions have been asked. People are kind of saying thank you. So I yeah, think let's, so it's let's just, yeah, we, we can close it there. So well, thank you. Um, I think if you're coming over in spring, we'll try and get you back. Uh, maybe do some work um, for us as well as for showing Overture, which is just looks like a really yeah. I'm sure we will make it. I think it will be a really nice moment to right. keep on our conversation in a concrete way, and I hope it will be inspiring for you for our first talk of the year in that really difficult moment. But we have we got still imagination. 